It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Therat is here. He's going to talk about why Steve Ballmer ain't going anywhere. A look at the new Mango and how you can get it on your Windows phone. And Google Plus versus MySpace. We have a winner. It's all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat, episode 215, recorded June 30th, 2011. Google Huggle. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code WINDOWS7. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers your mm, Microsoft needs. Not just Windows, my friends. No, no. Xbox 360, Windows Home Server, Zune, and more. And here's the guy who knows it all, Mr. Windows Phone 7 himself, Paul Therott. Wow. That was like a Mickey Mouse Weekly, by the way. That was nice. <laughs> Paul, no, that was the... Windows, comma, Weekly. <laughs> Windows comma weekly paul is the editor-in-chief of the super site for windows no comma there at winsupersite.com he's also the uh, news editor for windows it comma pro <laughs> and the author of windows phone secrets as i mentioned windows 8 secrets coming soon windows 7 secrets over and out windows vista secrets in the remainder bin and the delphi 3 super bible which all of you should have burning up the charts burning thanks up to the, the charts thanks to the constant mentions <laughs> Here on Windows Week. <laughs> so, Mr. T, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. Good, good, good. Lots of, uh, lots of. Uh... Oh, wait a minute. Stuff. We should start. I, I don't want to bury the lead. I'm okay. Looking at, I'm looking at your podcast topics. I was yep. going to start talking about Mango, and we will talk about that in a second. Yep. But Steve Ballmer, oh, yes, says, "Hell no, I won't go." According to Paul. Yeah, that's not an exact quote. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, have you listened to this audio clip? No, where is it? I got to listen to might it. Might be worth uh, playing. It is at uh, geekwire.com. All right. Forward should... slash 2011 forward slash Steve Dash Balmer. Was, was uh, this a interview he did or what's the story? No, he appeared at a local Rotary Club meeting on Wednesday. And so uh, someone finally had the cojones to ask this guy. You know, there's been a lot of talk about. Are you going to quit? Yeah. And uh, so, so is it a short clip or should it is I a short clip? It might in? be worth playing the beginning of it. All yeah. right, let me let me find it here. I'm looking. It's right at there in the page. Geekwire, Balmer, Microsoft Profits. Now, let me. Is it on the front? Let me go. Let me go uh, find this. Because here, do this. Um, go to geekwire.com uh, or geekwire.com slash 2011. Oh no no no! This is too many. No no, it's very it's very simple. Okay. Very simple. Okay. Slash uh, two oh slash one. Oh uh, yeah. Slash, slash Steve Dash Balmer. Steve Dash. Balmer. <laughs> I guess they didn't need no say no more, say no more. Yeah. Well, uh, this is probably a collection of articles about Steve Ballmer. Right? Oh, I see. Yeah. Let me play the audio clip. This is uh, Steve Ballmer's response to the question Steve, why don't you quit? Well, here's the question. Thank you for being here, Steve. Uh, recently, I read somewhere someone said that it's time for Microsoft to change its CEO. Steve Ballmer needs to go. Uh, what's your reaction to that? <laughs> Lots of nervous laughter, but you know yes. what? Good on her for asking the question. You tell me if I lack energy or conviction or we're not driving all the change we need to drive. You know, I, I don't think anybody doubts that Steve Ballmer lacks energy and conviction. I don't think that's what they're saying. Uh, you are not the first to notice that. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. I, you know, somebody asked me about this today, and the truth is I, I'm still on the fence. You know, I wrote that How Microsoft Can Fix Microsoft article a while back. Yes. But the truth is 
I don't have the answer. I, I don't know where Microsoft can go exactly to fix this problem. And I'm not, I'm not really positive that getting rid of Steve Ballmer is the solution. But um, the one thing I, I can confide, I suppose, is that, you know, as you know, I, I know a lot of people who work at Microsoft. I know a lot of people who used to work at Microsoft. And the one thing that is a little painful to admit is that a lot of them, I mean, the majority of them even, are not so happy with Steve Ballmer right now. And, um, you know, maybe I should just leave it at that. I mean, I, that's an interesting thing, you know. And I would just point out that there have been a lot of high-profile Microsoft executives who have abandoned the company mm -hmm. over the past couple of years, some of them under interesting circumstances um, and so forth. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, sometimes change is healthy. And maybe just on that note, they need something. But... I don't know. You know, you look at what they're doing with Windows 8, and, and he had some interesting, actually, this isn't in the audio. Let me find the, uh, my blurb about this. Uh, this. I don't think this was in the audio bit, but he goes on to um, talk a little bit about the coming uh, revenues for the fiscal year, which are going to be up significantly from last year. Um, he said almost $70 billion in revenue. Last year it was 62.5. Um, and he talked about somewhere in the 26 to 27 billion in profits for the fiscal year compared to less than 19 from last year. Uh, those are interesting numbers. I mean, that, those are big jumps in a year in which Microsoft supposedly did nothing, you know. Uh, and then he talked a little bit about Windows 8. And, um, you know, this in some ways is Microsoft's greatest strength and maybe Microsoft's Achilles heel, you know, it's over reliance on Windows. And he said, if you cut me open and saw what was inside, you'd I'd bleed, bl what, green? No, it's, it's Windows, 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 yeah. Windows, you know. He says, the company was born in the back of Windows. Windows underpins a huge percentage of all our success, all of our profitability, and all of the important things we do. So how important is Windows 8? Uh, very would be a very fair answer. Um, so obviously, there's you know Microsoft talks a lot about big bets and how they bet the company and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's fair to say that Windows 8 is a huge deal for them and, and a very important release. And we'll you know we'll see how it goes. Is that part of the problem that he bleeds Windows? I mean, Microsoft has other stuff. Well, I think it is part of the problem. You know, Microsoft's maybe overemphasis on Windows over the year. It's desire to name everything Windows something. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's actually hobbled the company in mm -hmm. some ways. You know, um, we sort of understand the strategy a little bit better now that we've seen Windows 8 and the new Xbox UI that's coming. But when Windows Phone came out last year, you know, people looked at this and they were like, how is this Windows? I don't understand it. You know, there's no, there's no correspondence between this and Windows other than the name. Right. Um, and now we understand there's a user experience, a similarity that will be coming in the future. But, you know, it's a new product, really, right? I mean, would they have been better off calling it Blanket? <laughs> you know, to reuse the name. Like I, the only name I can think of today. I, Blanket's I don't good. I'm not a marketer. I of think course. Michael Jackson's already taken that name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... I don't know. I, I don't have that answer for for Steve Ballmer. I, I, I just, this is one of those cases where I literally just, I don't want to say I don't have an opinion because, of course, I have an opinion, but I, I really don't have all the facts. I don't have an answer. I don't have a solution that would be better that I could say, look, this is the person, and everyone would say, yes, Paul, you're right. That's This guy would be better than Steve Ballmer. Well, nothing's going to happen unless the board makes it happen. I guess the share, at the shareholders meeting, you could have a vote of no confidence or something, but the board's but got fire. You know, don't you get the idea with all company shareholders, right? I, I follow these things. You know, Carol uh, Bartz from Yahoo fa finally faced some criticism right. as she was trying to walk out the door from a shareholder. Right. Apple holds these shareholder meetings, and, you know, the, the amount of time that's spent with anyone criticizing the company is held to a minimum. I know from Microsoft's own shareholder meetings, they have an annual one every year, not a lot of criticism. You think with this company sitting still for 10 years straight from a stock price equation that's, you know, some group of shareholders over time would be like, guys, seriously, you need to do something, but you never hear about that. And so the power of shareholders over the, the company that they own, you think would be sort of absolute, but you very rarely hear about those guys impacting the people at the top in, in when they should, you know. So in this case, does that mean... Microsoft doesn't need to make a change. These guys are all very comfortable with the ways the company's going. I, I, maybe. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I've been surprised by the lack of outrage, frankly. But I, but I see that everywhere. How could you as a Yahoo shareholder be anything other than outraged at what's happened with that company, i.e. nothing? You know, um, how distressing must that be? Right. 
Um, I would think as if you if I owned stock at Microsoft, and it was trading at the exact amount it was trading at ten years ago, um, yeah, I think I would have a problem. I mean, I realize there are other factors um, and other things that Microsoft does uh, with regards to shareholders and so forth. But um, I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't do this, so I don't know. But I, I follow it, and from my perspective, I'm always surprised that there isn't more outrage. Ek wonders in the chat room, why is it on Windows <laughs> Weekly, yes. all Paul and Leo ever do is talk about what Microsoft is doing wrong? <laughs> Wow. So um, I guess we could take a look at any random list of podcast topics, but I'll just look at today's. And one, two, three, four, it's a lot of what Microsoft's doing right. So I, I don't know what to say to that. Maybe people are overly sensitive when there's criticism, and that's all they remember. I think that's true, actually, yeah. Um, I think that's the first, true. The first topic is about Steve Ballmer. The rest of it's just Microsoft product stuff. And then a couple. And of I think it's a very legitimate question. Microsoft's stock price has been flat for yep. a long time. Um, I I think I'd be willing to say that Microsoft could benefit by um, new leadership. I think that some energy is required. Look, uh, that's big shoes to fill uh, for Steve Ballmer. He's, you know, he's replaced Bill Gates. I, I think there's been a natural evolution at the company where the what I think of as the old guard. That Jim Alchin generation right. of senior leadership gone. has moved on, yeah. even including Bill Gates. Yep. Right? Yep. I realize he's the chairman, but yes, he's not no. really involved. Ballmer's old guard, though. Wait a minute, because he's but been there for I a mean. long time. That's what I mean. In other words, Steve Ballmer is uh, the most obvious and, and of course, the, the highest up uh, person that's still left from that, you know, older group. Right. Uh, it is inevitable, obviously, that he'll step aside at some point, um, but. The future of Microsoft, the organization, the people who are there, is going to look very different somewhere down the line. And I have to think that, you know, Bomber's the CEO. It's hard to get rid of the CEO. If he doesn't want to leave, you know, he may not be going anywhere. Um, well, but, the board could fire him, but the, although the last we heard from the well, board Well, I'm just assuming that doesn't happen, I mean, ba based on the way things have gone. Right. So, you know, as a, as a shareholder, if Microsoft in, uh, I think it's about three three weeks from now, announces those earnings and those um, revenues, uh, you know, what's the complaint? We made a bajillion dollars again, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And we did it, it was, you know, I think it would be, it must be fiscal 2011, I guess is what they're calling it. So from June, or I guess July 1st, 2010, until uh, June 30th, 2011, um, name the major Microsoft product releases that occurred in that time frame, right? Um, you know, Windows Phone 7 obviously came out in October, but hasn't exactly set the world on fire yet. I, I think we can agree it's strategically important. And Office 365 just launched. Is that everything? No, I mean, I'm just doing this off the top of my head. I'm sure there were a couple others, but they didn't have, you know, there was no Windows 7 in there. And Office 2010 happened, uh, I think, earlier last year than July 1st, if I'm not mistaken. So they still did fantastically well, apparently. Yeah, so what's the complaint? Right. I don't know. You know, Balmer's been there. I was just thinking, we did an interview on triangulation with a guy named David Bradley, who uh, mm -hmm. wrote the IBM PC, original IBM PC BIOS, yeah. and delivered the first wire wrap of the PC motherboard to Microsoft nice. yep. so that they could start working on MS. Code named? Mm, I don't remember. Chess. Chess. And uh, he said, I knocked on the door at Microsoft. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't think they were in Albuquerque still. I think they'd moved to Seattle by now. And he said, Steve Ballmer opened it. <laughs> sure. And his bunny slippers and his uh, bathrobe. Said, what do you want? And he said uh, he gave him the wire wrap. So, I mean, uh, that's that pretty much goes back to the beginning. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't there at the very beginning, but Steve Ballmer's been there for a long, long wasn't time. Wasn't he Bill know. Gates' roommate at Harvard or, he, or his buddy? Yeah, uh, they were, I don't know if they were roommates, buddies. but they were buddies, buddies yeah. at Harvard. Yeah. So, yeah, Paul Allen predates uh, Balmer, but but not by much. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he is the old guard. I think that that's an interesting point. He's actually. absolutely the old guard. Yeah. And it, obviously in that position, listen, when, you know, Alchin retired on his own. He was retiring. Um, you know, Bob Muglia left under very suspicious circumstances. He had been there for a while. You know, there was a group of people before them, uh, well, not before Alchin, but before the Muglias of the world, you know, the Brad Silverbergs and um, uh, Rob... Uh, the guy from Real Networks, uh, 
I'm forgetting his last name. Glazier, G-L-A-S-E-R. So forth. Um, Ted Nelson, I think his name was. Todd Nel- Todd Nielsen, from who went on to... Uh, Oh God, I'm losing my mind. VMware and Paul, you know. Well, there were a lot of exoduses early on. I, mean, I can remember a lot of yeah. the Glazier left yeah. early on. These things have happened over time, but yeah. I, I think in recent years it's been notable. The last couple of years, you know, just the sheer number of upper echelon uh, executives leaving, sometimes not of their own volition, apparently. And this makes you wonder, right? Uh, these The reason we're having this conversation, aside from the obvious stuff about stock prices and so forth, is that, you know, there's been a lot of turnover at Microsoft. I mean, this is a company that. You know, you can kind of come in and punch the clock every day, and if you just keep your head low, you're pretty much guaranteed a great benefits and a decent salary. And there are people leaving the company, so you know there must be a reason. I'm not saying it's Balmer, but you know, I, unfortunately, when it comes to responsibility, uh, the, the, in this case, everything flows to the top. Yeah. You know, so you, yeah. you have to kind of look there. I like the guy. I mean, I don't know. See, I haven't it met him. I, he's not a likable guy from a distance. You know, the developers, developers, well, developers. I, you stuff. know, except that he kind of is because he's so passionate about Microsoft. I do admire that. No, you you're will right. never find a more ardent cheerleader of Microsoft. He would make a great Windows podcast because he would never stop talking about good news. <sighs> You'd want to punch him in the nose after a while. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> punch the monkey. Sure. Um, yeah, I just... Um, but I don't know him personally, and I'm sure he's great at a barbecue. I'd love to sit down. I'd love no, seriously, I'd love to sit down I, with I, beer. I've not barbecued with the man, but I oh, think I'm sure right. he is great at a barbecue, and that's the problem. You know, I think um, hmm, it's hard to dis- hard to uh, distinguish the personal from yep. the professional. Is there that the right word? I don't know. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the reasons I don't like to meet people because I like people. Actually, I, I hate people, but, but I was going to say, that's the exact opposite of the reason I don't like to meet people. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I actually don't like people. It always disappoint me. But if I meet people, I tend not to want to say bad things about them. It's yeah. like you don't say bad things. If Steve were sitting right here, I wouldn't say, Absolutely. hey, monkey boy. But yeah. um, so that's, you know, that you have to distinguish the two. That doesn't mean one way or the other whether he's a good CEO for Microsoft. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> moving along actually now that we've got the bad news out of the way there's wonderful news in the world of microsoft and all the happy happy stuff Most of it is strawberries and creams and <laughs> beautiful flowers it's coming up in moments so those of you who love microsoft and everything they represent stay tuned we'll be talking about the good news in just a moment before we do though i'd like to talk about squarespace.com the secret behind exceptional websites i think the offer code's wrong by the way oh it is changed isn't it it's changed. Look at me paying attention. You are so smart. It's now Windows 7, not 6. Apparently, uh, we've, we've incremented. <laughs> <laughs> I fixed it. See? I fixed it. I've got both Frederick and Lisa in here looking at me, giving me the evil eye saying, fix the offer code. And Paul, this, is, this is the, the people on their, honey, or their uh, anniversary? Yeah. No. Yeah, worst anniversary ever. <laughs> I'm so this sorry. This is what she's thinking. She is. You should see yeah. her face right now. She's going, yep. oh, my God. Well, I've seen this face. Ten I years see this married face to this a lot. guy. As you might imagine, this face is the face <laughs> I get pretty regularly. Yeah. We have an, actually an acronym. Is uh, it something like it's the what the hell just happened here face? No, it's an acronym for people who uh, uh, join their significant others at uh, the no Twitter Cottage. what they got into. LSS, long-suffering spouse. Yeah. So that's what Lisa is. A should long send her flowers or something. This is tragic. Spouse. But you know what I always make sure, I, and I'm telling you this, Gary, right now, we're in a beautiful part of the world. You go to the wine country, you, you, you have some wine, you eat some delicious food, there's shopping, there's antiques, there's plenty to do here, and she'll feel much better in a few days, maybe weeks. Uh, happy anniversary, kids. <laughs> Meanwhile... The trouble sleeping and the leg kicking will <laughs> carry on for another week or so. <laughs> Meanwhile... Squarespace, the secret behind exceptional websites. Everybody ought to have a website. A Facebook page does not count as a website. If that's what you're relying on, may I suggest you create a website at squarespace.com. It's very easy to do. In fact, you could try it free right now. Just go to squarespace.com. Click the try it. Do do we want them to go to squarespace.com slash Windows 7? Will that even work? No. Just go to squarespace.com. Click the try it free button. You can create a site literally in seconds, and it's good for two weeks. No credit card needed or anything. You could try all the great features, the photo galleries, the uh, form building, the widgets for social. 
integration, the incredible iPhone and iPad apps, the seamless importing from your existing site and exporting too, so you're never stuck, stats and more. Now, once you try this, it's very affordable. Now, I have to explain, Squarespace is web hosting plus the best content management software ever. And I'm, you know, can I say the best web hosting ever too? This site is just, never goes down, very responsive, no matter how much traffic you drive. And Kevin Rose uh, tweeted about this a while ago, where he said, in fact, I think the quote's on the Squarespace page. Let me see if I can find it. He said, um, I can't believe, you know, I just uh, got dug and slash dotted and said Squarespace just did a great job of staying up. I just, I'll tell you what, there's, this, there's an Easter egg on the Squarespace site, Kevin Rose's tweet. I don't know where it is. Somewhere it's on here. Really good hosting. And then on top of it, great software, which, by the way, um, is always up to date. So you don't have to worry about uh, security issues or anything. I mean, it's just, it's, it just beats the pants off the other guys. I want you to try it right now. Squarespace.com. Click the Try It Free button. Put your pants back on and then sign up. And by the way, oh, I was going to mention this. Now, it's hosting plus the software. You can get it as little as $10 a month if you sign up for two years. But when you do sign up, do use this offer code, Windows 7. Windows 7. Because uh, that'll give you 10% off your new account for six months. 10% off for six months. That's a good deal. It was, so this is why they changed the offer code. It's a new offer, even a better offer. 10% off for the first six months. Go to Squarespace. Dot com. Try it today. It's the secret behind exceptional websites. Did I do that right, Frederic? All right. She's nodding. I've passed the test. I can now continue on with the good news about Microsoft. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Paul Therat. You know, he's a jerk. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> uh, mango. I'm starting to see uh, people yeah. say, I, I got Mango on my, you know, you could, I guess this is always yeah. the case. You can get the ROM or something and download it and install it and that kind of thing. Right. Well, if you're a registered developer, which means you, you pay Microsoft $99 a year uh, to be in the developer program, you now or you will soon have access to uh, an update set of updates actually that will update you to this mango beta so it, it it's the same thing i got a couple of weeks ago I, I was actually expecting this to be a newer version but the the zoom pc software that you need and the actual software that eventually gets on your phone are both the same builds so this is the i don't know, just the beta version i guess they're calling it so i don't know if this is it and the next one's rtm or whatever but we're all up on the same version now the people on the beta so um, they're opening this up to developers. And I think the nice thing about this year compared to, say, last year when Windows Phone was the new platform is that they don't have to ship phones to everybody, you know, to get this stuff out. Everyone has phones now, and it's for, or it's very easy to get phones if you want one. And uh, now they can just ship the software, you know, so they're doing that. And I guess it's being rolled out. I, I don't think everyone has it yet. I think it's uh, going to take some time. Uh, before it gets to the hands of everyone. But there's new versions of the developer tools, a beta 2 version of the tools, which has the new version of the SDK and the, uh, you know, the emulator and so forth. So if you are a developer, uh, you should have it or we'll get it soon. You'll get an email inviting you in and, and explaining how you download all that stuff. Um, the one question I've gotten about this that's kind of interesting is from people who say, you know, yeah, I would pay 99 bucks to get this early. Um, could I just join the developer program? And I could be wrong, and I'd like to be corrected if I am, but I believe if you are not already in the program that, no, you won't get access to this. But I, I could be wrong about that. And I don't necessarily recommend that either. I can check. Uh, I, <clears throat> I suspect there are people in the chat room who are. Yeah, I'm thinking somebody yeah, would know the answer to that one. But anybody I think in the chat room, anyone? I think you have to have already been a, a developer. That's too bad because, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people would join right now. I always, you know, uh, you think about something like Windows 8, right? Microsoft, if they send an email right now and they said, hey, we could get you a beta version of Windows 8, but it's going to cost $99. Mm -hmm. And it's going to screw up your computer, probably. Uh, you know, you don't, we're not going to offer an upgrade from this version to the final, and you kind of do it at your own risk. I, I, they would, I bet a million people would sign up for this thing immediately just to get it. I agree. But maybe that's what they don't want. 
They don't want to support a million people for yeah, one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This uh, <clears throat> chat room has no idea. Yeah, but okay. <laughs> but they well, did send go me with, the, go they, with what I said. They did send me this image from the Android Marketplace apps by Microsoft Corporation Bing, mm -hmm. uh, and then a quote appended from Linus Torvalds: "If Microsoft ever does applications for Linux, it means I've won." Sure. I guess he won because, in fact, Android is Linux. You know, uh, can you imagine what kind of a job it would be to be working at Microsoft and have to develop in Java for Android? It must kill them. I, I mean, it must be the most <laughs> awful. They're probably, in fact, I'm sure there is a C-sharp tool that translates to GWT that translates to I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There ought to be. I hope there isn't. I hope it's hard. <laughs> Use Java. <laughs> yeah. They, I'm sure. sure, if they do, they have them isolated. Perhaps they've saram wrapped the building so that it won't leak out. That kind oh, of guys stuff. who program in Java and Linux are absolutely isolated <laughs> in every way you can imagine. <laughs> Please don't tell us what it's like. <laughs> um, you went to the uh, rollout, didn't you? Uh, was it yeah, uh, Tuesday yeah. for Office 365? How was it? Was it a good party? Well, I'm racking up the Amtrak miles. I can tell I you guess that. Yes, you are. But you know, they got uh, Wi-Fi. Right, <laughs> they did on the uh, Sella. They do, yeah. yeah and so, nice. yeah. Uh, Ed Bott and Mary Jo Foley and I had a little uh, tweet up event the night before. It was kind of nice. We had dinner uh, previous. That was also good. And um, party in the bar car. <laughs> oh no! Well, in yeah, in New York. So, but then they had the you know, and the event was actually at the same place where they had the Windows Seven launch, which was this bizarre deja vu moment where you know you walk right. up to the building like I've been I here before. I remember this. But how a big a, how big was it? Not a huge. It wasn't that big. I mean, as far as how many people were in there? Yeah, a couple hundred. And, and, they, and but they also uh, did they rebroadcast it or do separate events? I know there were events all over the world. They did webcast it. I'm okay. sure they had events around the world. Okay. I mean, they, I was really wondering if there was going to be some new news in the sense that I, I'm pretty well up to date on what's going on with Office 365. I've met with those guys a bunch of times. I've been using it since last year. We'll be switching to it uh, sometime in the months ahead. And, um, you know, I love it, recommend it, all that kind of stuff. But, I w you know, there's that one thing which you can make a valid argument for today. Well, actually, maybe, maybe there are two things. I guess the other one would be it's unproven, right, that even though Microsoft had a, a previous hosted services thing for Exchange and SharePoint, that this is essentially a different technology and, you know, we need to see how it goes. But the, but the one thing I think that you could make a valid argument against, if you were a very small business or – a startup, you know, somebody starting a small business or an individual, which maybe is the bigger deal, is Microsoft doesn't offer a free version. You know, the cheapest one you can get as an individual or as a small business is going to cost $6 per month. Yeah, per that's kind of a disincentive. I mean, it's not a yes. lot. Now, I would make the argument, and Microsoft, of course, makes the argument, that Office 365 is superior to Google Apps. And uh, you can point out the various ways in which that is true. There's actually a couple of ways in which that's not true. But uh, I can as, use Google Docs for free. And you can use Google Apps for free, actually, if oh, you have right, yeah. uh, less than, I think, 10 users or yeah. 10 or less users. Yeah. So, or you're an individual. Like, uh, you know, if you have leolaport.com and you want that to go through, G, you know, through Google mm -hmm, Apps, mm -hmm, you can do that. Mm -hmm. You obviously have to pay for the domain and all that kind of stuff, but there's no actual charge for Google Apps. So it would have to be enough better for me to pay six bucks a month for it. Right. So my problem is I do believe it's that much better, but... I honestly also believe that people don't care. Or uh, no, because you have to pay six bucks a month even to try it, right? Yeah. Well, you can, I mean, you could try it for 30 days for oh, free. You, you do? Yes, okay, that's good. All yeah, right. they do okay. have a, they have a trial. Okay. So you can see for yourself. But I, I think the issue here is simply that, uh, and this is something I've been thinking about lately because I'm writing an article about how uh, different things are these days. You know, back in the 90s, if you were to start a company, uh, and I was part of a startup in the mid-1990s, you know, you, you rented office space. And you got phone lines installed, and you have air on chairs and PCs, and you know there's a receptionist, and you you know you do all this stuff. And when you start a company today, you don't do any of that stuff. That's just a waste of money. Right. And there are all these different ways on the web, including the Squarespace stuff you were just talking about in the ad, where you can present a very professional face to the world in various ways using different services and so forth. Um, you, you know yourself as a company, you know, and, and look professional. And the thing is, when you're that cash constrained. Free always beats not free. Yes. You know, that's the problem. The other problem is a, sort of a perception thing. You know, when you think about the younger generation of people, the people coming up in the world, you know, they don't, they're not coming from a Microsoft-centric world. They're used to Google services. They understand how that stuff works, and they like free. They like free a lot, you know. And 
again, I would argue and do argue, and will I'll review Office 365 very soon. Um, it's better. My fear is that for that very small segment of the market, not very small, I'm sorry, it's not a small segment. For, the, for that segment of the market that is a small business, a very small business, or an individual, um, that's the one thing. You know, they just don't have it. I, I really feel strongly that Office 365 needs a, a free offering, even if it's limited in, in major ways, just to have it, you know, just to have it there. Um, so we'll see how this goes. I mean, it, it, it's going to be an interesting battle. I think it's fair to say that even uh, the moment they launched it, they, are, they already have more paying customers than Google does. They, and they already uh, almost certainly have as many overall customers or more right. than Google does on Google Apps. So uh, in many ways, this is a big win for Microsoft. But you know, we'll have to take a look over the next year um, and not just see how they do with the number of users, which I think is going to be overwhelming, but how they do with things like uptime and reliability and all that stuff, because that stuff really matters. And of course, every time any service goes down, you get the chicken little story from these guys. Oh, cloud, told you cloud computing. <laughs> so never going to help you. Yeah. So. Um, I'm seeing a note on this Microsoft <laughs> versus Mozilla. I thought uh, that war was over. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, I'm not sure I want to declare a winner, but. Yeah, it's uh, sure. It didn't turn out the way we thought it was going no. to Leo. But, <laughs> you know, I no, this is uh, remember, something new. I think I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. I yep. used to be on a show on MSNBC called The Site, remember, with Soledad That's and Ryan. 19, how I know you. 1994, 95, thereabouts, and I did an editorial. Every once in a while, they'd let me be myself. Normally, I was a cartoon character on that show. Yeah, Max Headroom. Kind of. It's Dev Null, same thing. <laughs> like a poor man's Max Headroom. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, every once in a while, though, they let me like show my face. Mm -hmm. They kind of grimace when I... But they would let me, and uh, so you were I a nice um, a counterbalance to Soledad O'Brien in that way. Oh yeah, because yeah, <laughs> I mean you're talking, kind of talking the spectrum here. Yeah, yeah, she was uh, definitely on the nice side of the bell curve, yeah. and I was on the Quasimodo side of the bell curve. I was going to go with the original <laughs> werewolf movie from the 1930s, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> Lon Chaney. I'm Lon Chaney Jr. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I did an editorial. Uh, it, Microsoft uh, had just come out with Internet Explorer 1. I don't know. It was 94, 95. It would have been the first version, right? The first one, yeah. And I, and I basically said, uh, hot, you know, Netscape, it's all over because Microsoft right. is here. And uh, I was told later that Mark Andreessen saw the editorial and came screaming down the hall at Netscape saying, who the hell is Leo Laporte and how do I kill him? Uh, but in fact, it was only... didn't try to eat you because apparently... <laughs> it was only a year or two later, yeah. uh, in fact, that it was all over for Netscape. Those were heady days, Leo. I remember the Heady well. days. So that was the original uh, browser war won by yeah. Microsoft. How do they stand today? Well... Uh, Mozilla is sort of standing still from a, a usage share uh, standpoint, but that's not actually what this is about. Um, as you know, Mozilla this year changed the way that they develop software, so they're going to come out with faster releases, more right. along the lines of what Google does with Chrome. Right. I actually think that makes sense. But, of course, you have to remember that only makes sense for people, for individuals, consumers. Right. Businesses do not want this. Uh, they do not want your software updating itself behind the scenes without telling you. They don't want things changed. They don't I agree, want but it's an issue. Things. Yes. So uh, ahead of schedule, apparently, you know, last week, uh, Mozilla released Firefox 5. Mm -hmm. After, uh, I think they released Firefox 4 in March, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this is crazy. It, like, if you know anything about Mozilla. I downloaded Firefox 4 two weeks ago, and Firefox 5 yeah. arrived a week ago. Right. So like, what? From a user experience standpoint, it's not very different, but, you know, this is the Chrome model for what they're doing. And they're going to release uh, version 6 and then 7 this year. So they're on the train. Right. Uh, or the treadmill, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it. And there was a little bit of a frou-frou this week because, you know, <laughs> when pressed about this, uh, some Mozilla, I guess, executives or representatives started saying that, you know, basically, they, this, is, this is not an exact quote, but, you know, we don't really care about businesses. Um, and if they don't want to use Firefox because of this, we don't care. They're not using it anyway. They're using IE. Uh, we want to do the right thing for our users. And then Microsoft, of course, lashed out at them for that. So I guess the only thing I would say is Microsoft's browser, Internet Explorer, has always been superior from the perspective of a company 
because it has all these built-in controls. Not just around group policies where you can restrict what the browser does or control what the browser does, where it goes and all that kind of stuff, but also the way you can deploy it. Microsoft has superior business class deployment tools. I don't know why Mozilla and, and Google have never embraced this stuff. It's actually not that hard to do, uh, but they haven't. So what we've created is this situation, which kind of mimics the way things are going in the real world in some ways, unless Microsoft changes things, where businesses increasingly are just using IE because it's the least friction. And then consumers pick the browser they want, and it's a mix of IE and Chrome and Firefox, right, essentially. Right, right. Um, so, you know, really what we're doing here is just mirroring the real world. But what this has given Microsoft and Mozilla is a chance to just kind of go at it in public a little bit, which we always enjoy uh, just for the benefit and the entertainment, um, you know, for us. But, I mean, honestly, what's changed? I mean, they're just, it's the same thing. as I mean, it, not, nothing has really changed other than Mozilla no, now never. is moving more quickly. And for whatever it's worth... If you accept the fact that most of their users are just individuals anyway, uh, that is, in fact, a benefit. Mm -hmm. And it's what most people want, so good for them. Yeah. Best of both worlds. Sure. Life goes on. I don't know why that's plus after Office 365. I must have moved things around. <laughs> I'm confused. My uh, I, podcast topic list is incoherent and out of order. Maybe you were going to talk about Office 2010 Service Pack 1. Coming. No, I think it was Internet Explorer 10 Platform Preview 2. It sounds good to me. Fire right. away, Gridley. <laughs> Leo, as you know, because I know you follow this stuff closely. What? Oh, I'm okay. Um, <laughs> I thought something just fell off the microphone. That's not important, is it? Is that a talking bit? You <laughs> my ass. So, uh, <laughs> no, I've, please continue on. I'm... No, no, it's okay. Uh, Microsoft today, uh, not today, yesterday, released the second platform preview for Internet Explorer 10, right? This is the version of the browser they plan to release concurrently or with uh, Windows 8 next year. And they're on this schedule where every 12 weeks or less, they'll release a new platform preview. That's the new schedule. So uh, the platform previews are aimed at developers. They Each of these releases uh, introduces some new... So some new set, I should say, some set of new capabilities, usually around HTML5 and CSS3 and uh, JavaScript and so forth, and with the notion of, you know, they're trying to listen to developers, you know, what, what is the most pressing stuff that's in the web standards that you need? But the thing that's interesting about IE10 now is that the little bit we know about Windows 8 includes such information as the programming model is based on the web. It's based on HTML5 and CSS3 and JavaScript which means it's based on Internet Explorer. And if you're going to write an application that targets this new environment, you're going to do so in ways that very closely resemble what's going on today in these IE10 platform previews. So it causes me, at least, to look at what they're saying about this stuff and thinking about uh, Windows 8 and how, how would this impact Windows 8. And, for example, I, I think in this platform preview, the thing I heard that sounded the most like a native programming capability is that it supports uh, an HTML5, I'm sorry, it's actually a JavaScript feature called Web Worker Support, or Web Worker, which is conceptually, but not technically, like threads in a native coding environment. It allows JavaScript right, code to right. run behind the scenes concurrently with it's a whatever demon. the users do. Yeah, it's a background process. Yeah. So that sound, doesn't that sound like a little bit of native code stuff you know like the, mm -hmm. this is the type of technology that will give html5 applications in windows 8 the ability to run and work like native applications you know so it's a little thing but and it's not the only thing but i think it's the most obvious of the examples uh, that, of the stuff that came out here where you you can see how this browser is turning web apps into, into things that are you know pretty much as powerful as native apps so i think from the perspective of end users IE10 platform preview 2 is not very interesting, right? It's a shell, uh, you know, with no user interface and all that stuff. So it's not like we're all going to run out and download this thing. But developers are paying close attention because they developers are paying close yeah. attention. Yeah, and and providing the feedback that Microsoft's using to determine what goes into this release, which I also think is important, mm -hmm. just on a different level altogether. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on there, and again, uh, you know, you can go look at, look at the stuff, at, you know, for yourself if you're interested in it. Microsoft has. I think uh, 10 new uh, tests that they put up, you know, the standards compliance tests that they do. 
and uh, they have a lot of pretty demos, and you can run them side by side with your other browser if it's you want so to make. It's so funny because each browser company has its own standards yes, compliant test. So Except Opera that, has well, Acid, and I mean, and and they all yes. do very well at their own test. Of course, but the one thing Microsoft does that the other guys aren't necessarily doing is that they really do want to promote the notion of. Um, you know, one block of code working across all the browsers. So they're right. trying to work with the other browser makers to ensure that not just that the, the script and the code, you know, the HTML code all, always works across the browsers, but that it works identically, right? That it's not enough to support a spec. We have to support those specs identically. Microsoft is also going back to the W3C and presenting them with these tests so that they can become part of the standard that passing these tests you know, assuming they're accepted, is what it means to become compliant with the standard. Um, so they're not doing them in isolation, which I think, you know, Firefox, when Firefox 4 came out earlier this year, they had those tests or those, right. you know, the demo site they did. And right. of course, Chrome has their own demo site and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, they're all doing uh, their own demos and their own um, websites that really show off their browser and always make their browser look faster than the other yes. browser. You know, we all do this thing, but... Um, I think it's important to look at what they're doing with the browser, Microsoft, that is, with an eye toward Windows 8. I think that's the, the big bit of news there. Now, Office 2010 Service Pack 1. I already got mine. <laughs> yeah. There's not much to it. I mean, I, I, I looked around just to see if there'd be any anything. You know, right. and I, from, a, from a functional standpoint, I don't really think you can point to much. Um, Office... 2010 service pack one doesn't even announce itself as a service pack in the about box you know it's it's, it's just a down, another microsoft update download yeah, it, yeah. It, it increments the build number for the office but there's really not much going on there um so you know for for people who are going to install office 2010 going forward it's nice to have this thing rolled in it's you know it, it pre-packages all of the previous fixes and it has its own set of fixes as well it's worth noting but um yeah, I mean, there's just not much to talk about other than that it's out, you know. Off, uh, service pack, so this kind of release is interesting to me because people, there's always these people that are very concerned about this, you know. You know, they keep Office up to date, but they really, you know, have you heard anything about Office uh, service pack one? I really want to get that for some reason. It doesn't change anything, but I, I need it, Paul. I need it bad, you know, but... <laughs> No, that's going on the Paul soundboard. <laughs> <laughs> now it's out. So you enjoy that I in your it. in your blanket. I need it. <laughs> you know, well, I actually, what's that thing called? What's the Google thing called? The Huggle? What is it? The Huggle. Yeah. The Huddle? No. What's it called? Huddle. Well, there's Huddle. Huddle. No, yeah, it's it? all catchy. There's streams, sparks, circles, yep. Huddle. 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 It's in my huddle. huddle. You can Huddle with your Office Service Pack. Enjoy that. I need I all. I need it bad. <laughs> oh, that's on the Leo I soundboard. I know you can't say anything, but <laughs> would you just nod if if it's coming this week? Would you nod a little on the podcast just so I know? Tug your ear, Paul. Yeah. I'm so glad we had this service back together. <laughs> um, no, I you know I was uh, I bought Office 2010 for the Macintosh from Amazon the other day. The download. 2011. 2011. Yeah. This year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Office 365. Because I, and I, you know, I mean, just, I, but I just. Office, Office 2011 it's pretty is pretty nice. Uh, it's odd to me. Yeah. It, it, it's, it I don't is like a, Outlook. I don't use Outlook. I'm sorry. No, no one should ever use yeah. Outlook. But it is. It reminds me of that French fast food restaurant I talked about one time where, you know, it, it's like someone went to the United States, saw the restaurant, didn't take any notes, and then went home and off of their memory created this restaurant that was sort of like McDonald's. Le Big Mac avec sauce privé. Yeah. That's, Très bien. That's what Office 2011 is like. It's, it's an Office productivity suite. There's no doubt about it. It even has applications with the same names. It has a ribbon, but it also has a toolbar and a menu. So the top, you know, the interface is yes. like six inches tall. It has I don't know what's to, up though, because I don't know why. you have to adhere all, to Apple guidelines. That's doesn't have to, though. You know, they could make a full screen app. Though. That's true. Now they can't. Maybe the Lion version will. I hope so. It, it really uh, needs to be fixed. Uh, you want, but. Uh, it is. It's a little bit of a hybrid. It's, yeah, it's, it's strange. It's the mule of Office. I think the problem is, I, I don't understand the Mac development technologies, but it must have been a... Uh, what do you call it? Not a carbon app, but a cocoa. 
Coco app. No, oh, I guess it was a carbon app, and now it's a Coco. It's a you know they have to move it to the new. What's the new one? The Coco's the latest. Coco's the latest. So it was probably a carbon app or something because it was. You know, dates back to the right. old versions. Oh, yeah, un undoubtedly. Microsoft I, I, always, I, yeah. I don't know about the latest one, but it, it, traditionally Microsoft has, has always kind of eschewed Apple's technologies. Even in, in the early days of Word, they used Microsoft did its own memory management. I mean, there's all sorts of <laughs> weird stuff. Well, uh, those were the days. Those though. were the days, my friends. We thought they'd never end. Okay, so let's talk about it. All right. Because I'm doing it. We're all doing it. <laughs> I'm a little concerned by you doing it. But, I okay. Look at this. Here's my circles. Yep. And I'm going to find Paul Therat, and I'm going to add you to my circles. Okay. Okay. So here's, here's what's weird about it. Well, actually, there's a lot weird about it. So let's, I'll just try Watch. to rein it in. Is he a friend? Is he family? Is he an acquaintance? Who I'm, is a he? Little of, I'm a little of everything. <laughs> He's, you, you can put me in more than one circle. Yes, I know. I'll put you so, in twits uh, for now. And just so we're clear on what's happening friends. here, um, this equates to your friends' Wait, lists yes. and or groups, right? Unfortunately, Facebook has different things that sort of do the same thing. Um, Not as easy to do as this, though, I have to say. No, but that's just a UI issue. I, yeah. I, I would, I, I, and I agree with you. You know, I find it bizarre that Facebook has both, both lists and groups. Right. Gr groups are something that people have to explicitly join. You can invite them, and then they can join, and then they know that you invited them, and then they know the name of the thing. So in some ways, circles is actually more like lists on Facebook. But Facebook lists are really hard to find. They're, they're really buried in the UI. They are there. So if I wanted to do something uh, like I want to share some photos on Facebook, I don't want to share them with my entire friends list, right? I just want to share them with the people in my immediate family. I could create a group or a list and then choose to share it with that set group of people, if you will. Right. Um, the list is something that's private to me. No one knows they're in it. But if I make a group, they have to explicitly okay the invitation to get in it, and then I can't kick them out. And if I want to, ki if I want to kill the group, if I want to – not kill the group, not literally kill the group, but if I want to uh, delete the group, I can't. Right. Um, the administration of that group will pass to someone else in the group. So you actually could lose control of your Facebook group. It's a mess. This is so a now, challenge. And, and the real reason it's a challenge for Facebook, Google, or anybody else is because it's so complex now. And um, you have this yeah. issue of making it easy for somebody to immediately grok and say, oh, I get it, I can use it, and of having a lot of features. And that's I think they're incompatible. Uh, and yet people demand features uh, and so simplicity. It's, yeah, it's a problem. I, I guess my big issue with Facebook, I'm sorry, with Google Plus, is that it's, I mean, it, it looks a little too much like Facebook to me. I, I, it's very Facebooky. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of bizarre. Um, this is the streams, which is pretty much the Facebook uh, wall. Like the wall, yeah. yeah. Although uh, what's nice, and I guess you can do this in Facebook too. Yeah, in fact, exactly what you could do at Facebook. So I could say, I'm going to say, I just want to see uh, posts from my friends. Yeah, but here's here's the thing. So up in the corner of your screen there, there's a red box with a number in it. Yeah, the right? notifications box. Yeah. yeah, now when you click on that, what you're going to see is Bob, Will, and Robert, and 200 other people have added you to Google+. Plus. Right. What heck does that mean? They're following you, just like on Twitter, but you don't but, have to follow them. It's asymmetric. But now you get into a, a privacy issue. So what does it mean to follow me on Google Plus? Well, because when I share, I could share publicly mm -hmm. or I could share just to you. So, No, but it, it, the problem is it immediately, that to, that to me right there says that's a warning sign. Right. This is, I have had no say over this. These guys are able to follow me. So this is our well, already. Like Twitter. Uh, right. Exactly. I was going to say this is already different from Facebook. Yes. It's more, it's more like Twitter. It's, it's public facing. Yes. My thing, and that's the thing, I think for a lot of people, you know, the Facebook thing makes sense because for them it's people I know. And I, that's a comfort zone kind of thing. Um, it's a little bizarre on Facebook, uh, sorry, on Google+, Plus, that people can find out you're using it and then choose to follow you, even though you may never publish anything publicly that they'll ever see. But now that I've seen that notification, it makes me wonder, is this a Facebook type thing where the controls are so hard to figure out that I'll never know yeah, how exactly. this works? Yeah. And by the way, I've looked and yeah, they are. Yep. This is another thing they've copied from Facebook. I mean, the, the privacy controls, not just the privacy controls, just the options, you know, the settings aren't just all over the place, literally, in the sense that some of them are 
can be found within the service, and some of them are out at your profile now at Google, but they're literally all over the place in the sense that they're a mess. You know, there's a lot of them. So it's... Uh, As Dave Morin says, on Google+, Plus, the devil is in the defaults. <laughs> well, that's true on Facebook, too, of course. Yep. I mean, yep. and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not positioning Facebook as the be-all, end-all. It's not like they've solved all the problems. But I, I think that, you know, Google Plus does have some stuff that's not in Facebook or in the case of that lists group thing is certainly a little easier you know, on the Google Plus side since it's newer. But if I were Facebook, I would look at this thing and I would say, okay, let's copy the good stuff and move on because I, I really feel that it would be pretty easy for Facebook to just duplicate whatever's missing. That's always the case. In fact, they hired uh, Paul Buchheit, who was the Google engineer who wrote Gmail, and who created FriendFeed, and uh, yep. Brett Taylor. Brett's now the CTO at Facebook. So this is, you know, I mean, basically Google's doing FriendFeed, and, and Facebook owns the FriendFeed code and their creators. So, yep. in fact, the, the Facebook CTO is the guy who created FriendFeed. So I think in many ways you're right. There's nothing new under the sun, and, yeah. and it's the other, easy The other to thing copy. that's kind of odd here is, you know, with the, obviously, there's a ping thing that Apple has, but with, with the exception of that, Apple has not made a, a Facebook clone. Microsoft has decided, uh, uh, probably smartly, that you know people aren't going to stop using Facebook and use Windows Live, so let's integrate with other services. I think that's a good approach. It's odd to me that Google feels the need to make something like this, and it makes me wonder. I think we talked last week about how Facebook is a very close Microsoft partner for some reason. I, I don't understand it. But I really feel like they've excluded Apple and Google. Oh, uh, yes, there's a fight. Google oh, yes. Explicitly, and, and maybe we'll never know why. Or, well, I think we have, access, we, have the, uh, we have the Axis developing, right? We've got the mm. Facebook, Microsoft Axis. It, well, how, was how, but how bizarre Apple. is it for, for the newest company in this group to align with the oldest? <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a weird partnership, I think is my point. I, I don't understand the, the, how it happened, but um, it's odd to me that Facebook is not a huge partner with both Google and Apple, right. and that if they had been, you know this never would have happened. This well, never would have happened. I, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, and these are shifting alliances. Yeah. Um, I think, though, that the lesson, the main lesson I'm taking from Google Plus is don't count anyone out. For a long time, we really said, oh, Google is not going to be able to do social. They're not going to be able to do social search. Microsoft Facebook is really going to capitalize on that and do a social search. Yep. And what is, what is the main benefit to Google of uh, Google Plus? It adds a huge amount of social data to their search. They now, if they can get a lot of people to use it, and so far they seem to be doing very well, even though it's invite only. Yeah. Um, they they've got some a lot of social signals, so but you know. Uh, but, but the big detriment here is that it's just Facebook clone. You know, and I agree that there's additional stuff, but this is like someone building a I, my this, my friend for briefs came up with this, so I don't want to take credit for this one. But you know, why do you buy an i? Why do you buy an HP Touchpad, or why do you buy a a Rim Playbook, or one of the two thousand different Android tablets? You know, because there's a group of people that just doesn't like Apple. And if, if that's your only point, then I'm not quite sure I get it, <laughs> you know? And it seems like this is that, you know? This is for those people who just hate Facebook for some reason, but, and yet feel the need to have something just like it. Apparently, <laughs> you know? I don't what know if this weird is, little market. This is probably not the Mark Zuckerberg. But. I would think. <laughs> it does look like a cam. You should add him to a circle. <laughs> I did. He's in my friends. Good. Or should I make him an acquaintance? Yeah, you might want to be careful with that. I'll put him in the Microsoft Groupies folder. You're the only one in there right now, so. Yikes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> now he'll be commenting on pictures of my family. Yeah. Well, and and, and actually, you hit the nail on the head. That's the real problem. It's not who's following you or who you're following. That, I think, is pretty obvious. It's Twitter. Yeah. It's the Twitter asynchronous model. It's this issue of now there's some bleed over, just as there is on Facebook, because of comments from somebody you don't follow showing up in your private. It gets very, very convoluted very quickly it's so, and difficult It's something to that out. you really need to think about. Yeah. Um, Facebook has proven that people don't think about it enough. Uh, they've also done things like change things behind the scenes and not told anybody. So the ground has kind of come out from under us and we didn't know. Well, and Google doesn't uh, have the best uh, track record, but yeah. I think they've learned from yeah. their buzz experience a huge amount. Of I buzz. would hope so, yes. yes. And this, this, uh, was, this was handled so much better than the buzz uh, yeah, launch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, look, uh, Google has a big presence, obviously, in the online world. And just the plus one button alone on, on different things is probably going to be a big deal. Um, 
I just uh, I think question there's a lot here that's going to be a big deal. This is very interesting. Unknown whether it's you know I thought Buzz was great and I love Buzz and it flopped miserably. So uh, yeah, I guess we'll see. You know, I, I'm I'm not I'm not sold on it. I, I agree, it's cleaner looking. You know, but I just uh, yeah, I have this already. You know. Yeah, I know, I have it already. I too. think that's my thing. Yeah, I have it. Yeah, and I think that's and actually no, how you know, real people are going to respond. If you're a Facebook user, one of the 750 have freaking this. million Facebook users, 99.9% .9 are going to say, "I have this already." That's yeah, the and, and uh, you know, I don't know how this works on the Mac exactly, but I mean, on on the window on Windows PCs, you know, I have this mixture of uh, online sites that I go to and uh, native applications and so forth, and they're all shortcuts in my taskbar here. Um, some of them are Google services, some of them are, Am are Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, um, all kinds of things. Um, you know, Google is obviously doing a, a UI makeover, which I actually kind of like with that black toolbar they have at the top and all yeah. this stuff. But I really don't feel like there's any compelling cross Google service thing going on. You know, they obviously have a lot of people using Gmail and Google Calendar and so forth, but that doesn't mean those guys are ever going to care about or use Google Docs or uh, you know, Google Reader or whatever the other stuff is that's in there. It's like, uh, you know, okay. I mean, you know, I, I, it looks like an attempt to say, look, like we're the suite of, you know, services or something. But, you know, people use Gmail and they use Facebook and they're going to keep doing that and, and life goes on. And I, I just don't, I don't understand why they need this, I guess. I think that's the biggest thing. Oh, I understand why they need it because they're trying to yeah. collect uh, the, to, to improve the search results, yeah. Yeah, um, okay. and, and I can think of other reasons. I mean, look, Google makes money by, by getting you to use stuff. Uh, the question is, why do we need it? Not why, not, not why does Google need it, but really more why do we need it? And, you know, yeah. uh, if, uh, here's, the, here's the big question. And somebody actually was talking about this on, uh, on Google+. Plus. Uh, I think it was, was it Anil Dash or uh, Fred Davis, maybe Fred Davis? Some, sm some, of the, some smart people, yep. uh, were say Fred Wilson, rather, were saying... Um, if this takes off, it seems to be doing well initially, but if it actually takes off, does this, and I think the very important, does this show that uh, it's not over, that the network effect, uh, you know, can be capitalized upon again and again? In other words, yep. how much friction is there? How much, how hard is it for people? You know, does Facebook now own it, own the world? Google clearly no longer owns the search I was going to say, what, what happens if it tanks? Then I, I mean, think you might say that there is a lot of inertia and it's going to yeah. be hard to move people off their social networks. And that's, uh, I mean, that should uh, impact other people and other businesses, other companies and so forth, looking at uh, oh, yeah. you know, companies that are trying to change the world. You know, maybe we're locked in in some ways. I have to say, though, uh, again, my, the thing that I conclude is that don't write anybody off. Google had been doing this, obviously, in secret for at least a year. Yep. Uh, I had kind of started to write Google off in terms of social, and uh, that was a mistake. They, 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 they learn from their uh, mistakes. They have smart people still there. You know who did a lot of the UI, which is beautiful? Andy yeah. Hertzfeld, the original so, Apple uh, designer. Um, Macintosh designer. Yeah, you know, uh, when Aaron Hilgas was on a month ago, whenever that was, he recommended a, bo a book. Um, I think it was called Dreaming in Code. Yes. Which I've been reading, and it's fascinating. Awesome. Yes. Um, I will use it as a future Audible pick myself. It's a great book. Um, it is a great book about the most inconsequential software product ever made, ever, <laughs> Chandler. And uh, the guy who did the UI for Chandler, at least in the beginning, was in, although he left the company before the final version came out, was uh, Andy Hertzfeld as Andy well. Andy also uh, started Danger, so the sidekick software is, I yep. think, Andy's. He wasn't yeah. a UI designer at Apple, by the way, with a Macintosh. He did the no, he ROMs. Was not. He was a yeah. deep, yeah, yeah, hard yeah. code programmer. Yep, yep. So, but he's, I think he's done it. I think this is interesting because uh, Google clearly said, well, we don't really understand <laughs> UI very well. Maybe we ought to get somebody in here who, uh, who can help us with yep. this. And I think that, well done. I mean, it, you know, it's difficult to expose all of this complexity in a way that people get it and want to use it. And, uh, and I, you know, this is, by the way, a picture of San Francisco from Zeppelin. That, uh. it, that was posted by Sergey Brin. I'm not sure who he is. Sounds Russian. Sir, you're not sure who he is? Not sure who he is. It looks uh, like a uh, photo of a cemetery. But can it's, I, it's can I say something? I think he owns this airship. Yeah, I'm sure he does. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think this is his, uh, his, his own... Uh, well, pardon me, it's not a so blimp. It's, it's it's a Zeppelin. <laughs> Zeppelin, yeah. If it was a Microsoft guy who owned it, there would be missile launchers on the bottom of it. <laughs> Here, he is. Sergey Brin is really starting to cause problems by peeking into uh, something. Is that uh, 
neighbor's backyard. That looks like there's there's laundry hanging out there. I hope that's uh, is that Bill Gates' <laughs> it, house? It looks it looks like a Google facility. <laughs> I think, I'm kind. sure it is. I don't think he'd post it if it weren't. This is Mountain View. This is Area 51. <laughs> this is why traffic in California. This is the Nava Prospect back so uh, train station horrible. from Half Life Two. <laughs> I guess that was a prison. Whatever. <laughs> no, that's the airport. That's the San Francisco airport. Nice beach pictures. This is life in a Zeppelin. That's what people forget. When you look at a Zeppelin, it looks so peaceful and calm yep. up there. The engines go... The whole time. Oh, my car must be a Zeppelin then, because that's what it sounds like. <laughs> or a Yugo. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in all of this talk about the new social, Google+, Plus, Facebook, yep. wither MySpace. You know, someone should write a book about this. It, would, it could be called uh, Technological uh, Might Have Beens. Or Tom right? is My Friend. <laughs> Tom is My Friend. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, there, there were these products along uh, throughout history, throughout the history of the tech industry, that should have made it, you right? Bet. That, that should have controlled the world and, or at least their market. And MySpace is absolutely one of those things, a service in this case. But they they had it, just like by the way, Google sort of had it with Orkut, right? They they well, had they kind of they had kind of invented right Facebook, you right. know, and then right. they didn't do anything with it. Right. Um, I think they, even they would admit now that that was a mistake. Um, but yeah, but MySpace was the real deal because they had users. Um, they had apparently no control over what they could share. I mean, MySpace was a, a disaster in many ways, too. But, I mean, it was amazing how many people were on there. It was uh, the rejuvenation of the blink tag, if I'm not mistaken, was a big aspect <laughs> of MySpace. Um, but I've never seen anything so popular die so fast. Yeah. You know? Well, maybe that's the example of the network effect. You know, the network effect we should explain is that thing that happens when you get critical mass. Enough people join a, a thing like MySpace or Facebook that everybody else yeah. needs to join and it snowballs. And MySpace had it. I mean, MySpace was where you had to be. Yeah. yeah. I, well, so it did. But, you know, every time I went and looked at it, I hated it. And the reason I never joined MySpace was because of how awful and unprofessional it looked. You know, not that I was looking for a. Like I've never joined LinkedIn either. Well, uh, that's not. It. I guess I technically joined LinkedIn. I don't. I don't use LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I, just, I uh, deleted my uh, LinkedIn account because I decided. Uh, I just don't use it. I don't use it. I don't need it. Um, but, and so it wasn't so much professional. But, you know, there was something unkempt about MySpace. You know, it just seemed, it seemed like a virus vector to me. You know, it just it never felt professional or real. And I think I don't know. Maybe that was part of the problem. But, uh, you know, News Corp had purchased this thing. I don't know if you remember the amount, some several hundred thousand dollars. Was it that, uh, that little? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It was in the millions, hundreds of, huh? oh, I'm sorry, million. Uh, several. <laughs> sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> what a deal. <laughs> I want one million dollars. No, I, uh, I come from the past, Leo. Several <laughs> hundred million. Hundreds of thousands million, of dollars. Sorry. Million, several hundred million. And, uh, 35 you know, million. And now it's like yeah, for next to nothing. It's like a, it's like buying it at a garage yeah, sale. That's the current the current. How uh, much for this MySpace over there? Can and, I talk you down and, to thirty five? Who is this specific media that bought it? Yeah, I don't know. It's probably a consortium of entertainment industry guys. I mean, I think the one thing that MySpace had going for it, although this has completely disappeared, was that music industry tie-in. Remember, there was a there was always like a MySpace thing. You go to a concert and you could. Yeah, and there's still a lot of still a lot of independent musicians on uh, MySpace. They? Oh yeah, so MySpace yeah. News Corp bought it six years ago for five hundred eighty million. Five hundred eighty. So and now they it's sold 35? it yesterday to specific media for thirty five yep. million. Thirty five million. You know, when you compare it to recent purchases, you know, um, Microsoft is purchasing Skype for eight point five billion dollars. Billion. Billion. So much so that eBay actually made money. On yeah, imagine Skype that. Deal. Imagine that. That's kind of the the stunner. Yeah. So uh, apparently Justin Timberlake is a part owner of Specific Media, so that solves it. <laughs> well, I don't know if it All solves. All they need is Ashton Kutcher on the board, and man, they're golden. Money, baby. I would. I don't care if I'm wrong about this one, but I I see no I see <laughs> I no future right. for my space. I'm sorry. I think I just, it's a safe bet. Wow, specific media. Well, you know, sometimes you can say something like, I hope to be proven wrong in a later. I, I just couldn't care less. I, I my, whatever, MySpace. I mean, I, 
it's too bad but it's uh, you know it's interesting only because it was such a car wreck you know um, somebody said that specific media put justin timberlake on the board because they thought he invented napster they got <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> i hope that's true room. that would be great very good <laughs> that would be great <laughs> It's good. Specific media, three visionary brothers, one revolutionary company. Tim oh, Vanderhoek. I hope, I hope they're Kardashian brothers. The Vanderhoek brothers. They founded it in 1999. They're an online yeah. advertising uh, play. Well, they obviously have enough money to buy, uh, buy MySpace. Yep. Neat. Neat. They, they probably won the California State Lottery. <laughs> Neat. Yeah. Neat. That's so nice. What do you want to buy? Let's buy... Uh, Neat. Can we buy Facebook? No. No. Let's see. What's the what other thing? Is, what else is out there? Who else can we buy? <laughs> so we've got yeah, a like Windows we're... Weekly Tip of the Week, Windows 7 App of the Week, Windows Phone 7 App of the Week. It's all coming up. The best part of the show still remains, so don't go anywhere, folks, while we talk about our good friends at Netflix. Netflix.com okay. slash twit. Well, I, that was called a pregnant pause. It would happen eventually. <laughs> Please. Please. <laughs> Hold on. Don't go anywhere. Oh, I know you're you. already a Netflix For member, but have you podcast. thought about sending Grandma a, a, a membership? Please, just find somebody who doesn't have Netflix and tell them to go to Netflix.com slash twit. Please, I just beg of you. I just I if you like this show, if you like me, if you if you if you just want to help twit, Netflix.com slash twit. Just tell put it buy it put it on the billboard or something. Just go tell everybody. Look at Betty Grable, the beautiful blonde from Bashful Bend. Yes, you could watch that tonight, right now, on your if you had Netflix. Netflix.com slash twit. This is uh I don't know how I got this list. This is the classic feel good action and adventure list. Hope and Lamour, Road to Bali. Hope and Crosby, The Road to King Kong. Tyrone Power in Old Chicago. So I, maybe because I was trying to find classic movies. Romance on the Range, starring Roy Rogers and Gabby Hayes. God, I hope there's a woman in this. Uh, anyway, the, <laughs> it could be a whole new thing. Uh, before there was Brokeback Mountain, there was Romance on the Range. Uh, Get Shorty, The Sting, A Hard Day's Night. They just started putting, uh, I mean, there's so many great movies on here. Uh, and TV shows, too. Mad Men, Glee, uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. I mean, it just goes on and on. It, kids, too. Yes, yes. iPad, iPhone, many Android phones. Uh, Windows Phone, right? Netflix, Windows Phone, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Would I lie to you? You might, but I, I am telling the truth. It is. He said it, so it's got to be true. There you go. And uh, it's kind of actually great to be able to watch this on uh, on your portable device, not to mention your home TV, uh, many Blu-ray players. Your Netflix uh, is available on your Roku box, your PS3, your Wii, your Xbox 360. So I know you're already a member. If you're not, well, please take this as encouragement. Oh, here's a movie called Pain in the Ass. <laughs> The Paul Theron story. <laughs> it's French, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure in French it's a better uh, title. Um, you can, you can, uh, you can absolutely have a great time going through this. We every night, Abby and I, because she's home from college, we'll spend uh, a few minutes looking at and uh, at the different movies, and we'll watch a different movie straight from the streaming. And it's 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 togetherness with you and your family. Torchwood, ooh, Torchwood's on here now. Netflix seasons one through three. I can catch up. Netflix.com slash twit. If you're not a member, join. If you are a member, tell your friends. Tell them Paul Therott sent you. And now, Paul Therott, it's time, as always at this as time. As it must. As it must always be for our Windows Weekly Tip of the Week. <laughs> uh, as I noted in the article that is associated with this topic, uh, if I, I believe that the most popular article I've ever written was about slipstreaming service pack two at the time and then three into windows xp people love this stuff you know and it's it's one of the tragedies of windows in recent years that they intended to make slipstreaming very easy with mm -hmm. windows vista mm -hmm. we're never able to do it uh, there was a a problem in the rtm version where they were they they were gonna have to make a change to the servicing engine and then that was going to come in vista service pack one and then it never did and now it's just now they're just not doing it so 
Uh, interestingly, this method of slipstreaming service packs into a product exists in Office 2010. I think it was in Office 2007 as well, actually. Um, it's really simple, but what it allows you to do is create an instance of the setup program that has Service Pack 1 uh, with it. It's actually not integrated in, in, a, in a technical way. The, the updates are just sitting there side by side with the original uh, program, but when they're in the right place, Setup knows to apply them, and what happens is Service Pack 1 gets installed as part of your original install of Office 2010. So it's a pretty easy process. I've got a, an article up on the website that will step through it, but um, basically what you do is you take your Windows uh, 2010 setup DVD, extract it uh, to your hard drive, download Service Pack 1, extract those files, you know, put them, lump them together, and then uh, throw them up on the network or make a DVD of your own. And uh, you have a slipstream version of Office 2010 with Service Pack 1. I love it. What was that program that I used to use to uh, sl put the slipstreams in Windows and make the images? Yeah, was it uh, uh, was it Nine Night? Was it Nine? It wasn't Nine Night, and that's why I'm confused. Uh, no, no, no. It was nine uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was light. Um, yeah, yeah. She's uh, terrible. And light. And light. Thank light. you, yes, chat yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Tinker Toy Tech. Yeah, Vista was going to put those guys out of business, but then of course they never never did. They never came through. Oh. It was going to be really cool because all you had to do was copy the file, you know, the service pack file mm -hmm. to the updates folder and you were good to go and it, and now you have all the updates. And it was a great idea. It, it works great in Office and uh, they never did it for Windows, so Windows 7 app of the week. Yeah, this is an interesting one, and you're going to laugh when I say this because, because <laughs> I really I don't think I'm actually going to use this application, um, but I I recognize that it's a really good <laughs> application for what it is. I I have been exploring of late the various ways in which you can combine different email accounts and what the best ways are to do that. You know, if you think about this, you could do it up in the cloud where if you have two email accounts, you use one of those accounts to gather mail from the other one, and then you just use that one interface. But there are actually other ways to do it, and including native applications, either on Windows Phone or whatever device you use. You know, if you use um, an iPhone, I think you can have multiple email accounts, but they all go into the same application. Yeah, right? unified inbox. Yeah, so Windows Phone Mango adds that feature uh, to, to Windows Phone, for example. It's kind of a, necessary, because we all have, mul well, we don't all, many of us have multiple accounts. Yeah, many of us have multiple accounts. And it's confusing because th there are... Like I said, there are many ways to do it. You can, uh, you if you have a Gmail and a Hotmail account, for example, you could push mail from Gmail to Hotmail, right? Forward email, or you could use Hotmail to uh, collect the mail from Gmail. And and there are advantages to do it, doing it in either way. Uh, the different transports you can use, uh, you know, Pop or IMAP or whatever. And it's it's a messy area. I intend to write something about this in the future, but as I was researching this, I came across an application for Windows and also for the Mac, for whatever that's worth, uh, called Postbox. It's actually in version 2.5, not uh, 2 there, as I wrote, but it, it's a native mail application uh, for Windows. It's it, it has a beautiful UI. Windows or Windows Phone 7? Windows. This is a Windows 7 Oh, okay, app. okay. They actually have a Mac version, too. There's also a Mac version, that's right. Now, the thing, here's the crazy part. You actually have to pay for it. Uh, this is a trial version. It's it's twenty dollars, but I could really see this a application uh, appealing to people. It's got a beautiful UI. Um, it has nice multi-account support. It it doesn't do a couple of the things that we care about a lot in the Windows side of the world in the sense that it doesn't support Exchange and it doesn't support, you know, the Hotmail native stuff. Although you can do pop through it, but if you if you what you want to do is. Uh, have one application on Windows that will combine all of your accounts into a single place. Like this is actually a nice one. Now, obviously, you know Microsoft has Windows Live Mail, and if you wanted to, you could, um, you know, punish yourself and use Microsoft Outlook or whatever. But um, the reason I, I picked this was I was really taken with the UI. I actually spent a lot of time, even though I knew I was, <laughs> I'm not really going to use it going forward. But I spent a lot of time configuring it with all of my accounts just to kind of play with it. And it, it's just a beautiful app. It's a beautiful app. And uh, I know that there are people who do this thing, uh, do this kind of thing. You know, there are people who use Thunderbird, for example, uh, the Mozilla product. I and this actually is... have tried a ton of email programs on Windows, including yeah. Pegasus. Remember that? The Bat? Oh, absolutely. The yeah. Bat, which is yep. a very interesting, good program. But yeah, Eudora. Them, I, I've used them all. I mean, Eudora was great. Yep. None of them are yep. as slick as this, though. This looks very pretty. It's beautiful looking, yeah. you know. Yeah, so um, I, I just just take a look. I mean, it, there's a certain group of people that just want a native Windows app 
or you know, an, an actual app, not a web page. And I think we'll be quite taken by how this thing looks. It has, it just has a beautiful look and feel to it. It really is a nice looking app. So yeah, yes, it's not free, and and yes, it's yet it's not another expensive, app. is it? How much? No, no, it's, I think it's twenty dollars. That's nothing. Yeah, it's a beautiful app. So. Like I said, yeah. for, uh, I guess it's normally twenty nine, uh, but it's nineteen ninety nine. Ninety five right now right. is nothing. Yeah, I think that's a very fair price. You can uh, you can try it for free, so you don't have to pay yeah. for it just to try it. Just check it out. Yeah, I, it's, it's funny. Uh, it's I don't neat. think I, it's funny. I don't. Uh, I use uh, Apple's Mail program. I feel like yeah. that in many ways looks like Apple's Mail program. I'm not so sure. So one thing I've necessary. read about it. Yeah, so it's uh, Apple's Mail is kind of the basic thing, and then this is like that on on steroids. You know. Okay, I'm gonna uh, try it. Yeah, take a look at it. I, I I would be surprised if you used it. It's 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 nice. Mail. We spend so much time in mail that a good mail app, I think, is is absolutely critical. And I have yeah. been fairly yeah, yeah, yeah. disappointed by almost everything I've seen on the Windows side. I I just so yet to find the right uh, this is a topic for another day. But I I would just say that there there are a lot of differences between the ways different services work and the way that different applications work. So, for right. example. Uh, Microsoft's email solutions, no matter what you're talking about, Hotmail or Exchange or, you know, 365, use folders. You know, Gmail's does not, essentially. It's a, it, like a virtual folder system. Um, so there's a difference. Microsoft's end-user applications support these quick views, things like unread mail. And I think one of the nice things about that is you can have a consolidated inbox of some type where you have multiple accounts going through one client, and you can see all of your unread mail in a single view like you can on iOS and in Mango, but on Windows. So there's some value to that. Um, I happen to think that Microsoft's Outlook client is too busy, is top heavy. Um, and then Windows Live Mail is okay, but it doesn't work with the Exchange type account. So the problem is that nothing is perfect. Um, and you know, this Postbox 2.5 is not perfect. It won't work with Exchange and so forth. But if, if you have typical email accounts, you know, Gmail, um, you know, AOL, whatever, you know, it works great. And again, I think the aesthetically it's going to appeal to a lot of people. So it's, it's something to look at. I'd never heard of it until this week. It's, um, it's a nice looking program. Yeah. I'm going to check it out. Yep. Coolness. It's, and there's a, I'm sorry. No. I do like your windows phone seven pick of the week though. But wait, I just want to, I, I just two additional ones because we mentioned it. Um, you know, if you are a developer, the two other app picks, of course, would be IE 10 platform preview two. And then I mentioned the Windows Phone Mango developer tools. Now, even if you're not in the developer program, anyone can download the beta developer tools for Mango and can develop Mango apps using the emulator. So that's available to everyone for free. And if you and you know, downloading the developer tools, as is always the case with any product, is a great way to keep up with technology because you know there's always stuff in there that's not exposed in the actual you know OS yet, but you can see the the API. So, for example, we knew custom ringtones were coming, but it, it wasn't until this past week Microsoft finally discussed how they were going to implement it. But developers had that access previous and ah. could say, could say, well, there's custom ringtone stuff in here, but there's no UI. What's going on with that? And now we know because there won't be any UI. <laughs> but you know, they explained that. But um, it's a neat way to keep up on what's going on in this case with uh, Windows Phone. So, be sure to check those out as well if you're a developer. And now, may I say it now? Yes, please do. The Windows Phone 7 App of the Week. So, obviously, Angry Birds has been out for like 19 years or something. <laughs> um, but I, I would like to just say that, you know, I, I, had, I had what for me passed as a, a comic interchange in my, the comment section of my blog where someone said, you know, screw this. I'm not, you know, I would never pay $2.99 for this app. It's only 99 cents on iOS and you can get it for free on Android if you want an ad supported version and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, my, my two reactions to that were, well, actually, this one was from Twitter. I said, you know, yeah, I said, you can save a lot of money and just go buy an Android phone and then you can get this app for free. I agree. That's a, that's a great way to do things. Or... You know, he, one guy compared it to a sandwich, and he said, you know, when you pay two ninety nine for a sandwich and you know the other guy got it for 99 cents, it kind of makes it taste a little off. And <laughs> I'm like, all right, let's beat this to death. You bought a sandwich for two, you live in the United States, and the sandwich costs two ninety nine. Are you not going to buy it because you could buy it for 99 cents in Europe? <laughs> really? I mean, well, you're going to you're gonna starve because well, someone else got it. I principles. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's funny to see the reaction to this. Yeah. The truth is, Yes, uh, Angry Birds has been out for a while. Yes, this is the first version of the game, and 
They're on version 3 on iOS. Yes, I know, I know. But, you know, the truth is Angry Birds is one of the best pure uh, touch games ever made, uh, one of the best mobile games ever made. It is. It's a classic for a reason. It's still it fun. And if you've never played it, it's new to you. And by the way, if you play it on Windows Phone, you get achievements. So uh, Xbox Live achievements. Bloop. I think this is my bloop. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, I, I, I hear you. I understand the complaint, but... Let's just say, uh, you know, I paid for this, this the first second I could, and I, I own it, I think, everywhere else in the world, including on well, Windows think, PCs for free. So Yeah, now that it has Plants vs. Zombies, last week's pick, and uh, Angry Birds this week's pick, you can say it is a first-class gaming platform right up there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, really I mean, what you needed. The pieces were always in place. You know, they, are, they, are, they had the, win, the Xbox Live stuff. They have uh, great support for games, hardware acceleration, all that stuff. Um, and we've been ticking them off, you know, over the past few months, game after game. But yeah, now I, I, this is the, you know, this is the A tier we're at now. Plants vs. Zombies and Angry Birds. If you don't have these, if you've never played either of these games, and you have Windows Phone, yeah, you're going to want to get them. They're, they're great. They're, 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 like I said, they're classic for a reason. They're excellent. And they will define a, a certain era of gaming, not just mobile gaming, but gaming, you know, in the same way that whatever games did in, in previous generations on different platforms. I mean, these are... Um, they're big for a reason. They're great. So now that I've apologized for Angry Birds. Like I couldn't already get that song out of my head. <laughs> that actually was an unusual uh, cover by a band called Pamplemousse. I, I, I saw that, yeah. I love them. Yeah. I want them to be our house band for the new Twit House. <laughs> right. But well, they I, have to be chained to something so they can't leave. Well, the reason that they could be the house band is there's only two of them. Yes. Which <laughs> has certain yeah, merits. Stand at the corner. Yeah. Hey, I want to invite everybody who is not yet a, uh, a brick holder to get your brick. Time is running out. We were selling these. Uh, we still are to uh, raise money for uh, the studio, which ended up costing close to a million dollars. And uh, any help that you can give us would be much appreciated. No, we're not a nonprofit. But you would. Actually, I cannot wait to see the wall because it's going to be really cool. So many great bricks. Uh, people have purchased so many funny things, but also memorials, uh, URLs. You can even, if you get a uh, an 8x8 brick, you can even have a logo uh, on the brick. And, uh, you know, a couple of interesting people, some of our sponsors, but also the Data Liberation or Front from Google have bought a logo brick. So that's kind of cool. Uh, it's going to be a, a reason to visit the new studio is this, this wall of honor. If you haven't yet uh, bought a brick hurry time is running out do we get bricks for free or what happens there? no in fact i don't even get a brick for free but would you would you I like a brick see. i can get you a brick <laughs> i'll get you a brick <laughs> no let me get you a brick i want I, I have to think of something special you know i want it to be like a like a blue screen of death brick or a but somebody something. already has done uh, 404 brick not found yeah so i but i want the you know the, it could emulate a, a blue screen i or believe something. there is a bsod brick i'm not sure okay should we need to look into this you should have one that says leo loves windows <laughs> Aha! no mine will say screw you laporte it'll be like a fish shake i think jason already has that one but uh, <laughs> but uh actually it's it's awesome uh it, it's really a fun promotion we've really had a great time if you are international uh you can't use the website but the good news is you can call toll free 855 twit brx and uh, buy internationally and the this the uh uh, reps are very nice. I got an email from a guy who bought it internationally. He said, "You know, it was one, it was a great experience. I really the, they were very nice on the phone and they helped me and uh, and we got a great brick. So uh, we really appreciate this. If you if if you want to help us out, and please don't feel obligated to, but bricks.twit.tv. And Paul, I should tell you, yes, sir. We have set a date for the opening for the opening and the transition. So. Uh, Save this date. Uh, we're going to do the first show we'll do from the uh, new studios will be July 24th. Oh, that's uh, Sunday. That's, that's a twit. That's far away. Well, we st you know everything's done except we have to do, and we're going to start tonight lighting and cameras. Uh, and then we have to move crap over there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that has to go over there. But we have everything over there now that we need to broadcast from there. Hmm. Um, so this studio can stay up. While we could figure that studio, that's why we went right. to analog over here, and it's a little noisier. And I apologize to people, but uh, we our our high quality super super duper Axia audio board went over there, so we could configure it. Uh, but the twenty fourth will be the first show that'll be a twit on that Sunday, and of course we'll do uh, Windows Weekly the following Thursday from the new studio, um, which 
in your case will look exactly like the old studio because <laughs> it'll be my my we've we've duplicated yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so you won't notice any difference. So, you know, oh, so thanks for the heads up. You should have just let me not know and I see if I noticed. You might not have noticed. Well, you, I won't say anything. You might forget it. Uh, but I do want you to save the date, uh, yes. particularly uh, August 21st, because that's our grand opening party. We'd love you to come out for that. If you uh, feel like it. That's a uh, actually, Sunday. Well, actually, I might be there. Um, let me look. We'll put you up. Well, I might actually just be there uh, August 21st. It would be great if you were. I am going to be there. <laughs> Another airfare saved. So, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, no, I mean, I'm coming out with my family. So August 21st is a Sunday. Sunday night, we're going to have a gala opening. Please yep. bring your whole family. I, well, um, we to, will be yes, doing, I, you'll have to, I understand. I'm there. But we'll so, put you up. We'll get you a place in Petaluma no, no, so you can no, come no, no, no. We're, we're there. We have a home. Oh, I can't we're, wait. Oh, I'm so thrilled. Yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, and we will uh, be doing a 12-hour broadcast. You don't have to stay for the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 7 p.m. I, I intend to work as little as possible that week. But uh, For yeah. people who are watching, we are allowing uh, up to 50. We have a lot of room, so we can have up to 50 people in studio for the first show. That whole okay. first week, we will have seats for 50. But okay. you must email my sister to garner Your a place. sister? Yeah. What, what is this? Like a family business? Now? Yeah. No, my this, sister. She lives in Providence. She's making you can go, pies you can, for the yeah, opening. She or something will. Like. She, Eva, E V A at twit.tv. Uh, she's always kept track of who's in studio, right, guys? You all contacted her and said that way you know that there's room and everything, and we will cut it off at, after 50 people. That whole first week, July uh, 24th through the 31st, 50 people. And then we're going to figure out how many people we can reasonably hold. We're actually renting seats for 50. And then at the party, same thing, but we will throw you out at 7 p.m. because the party. <laughs> <laughs> is invitation only okay. so we can accommodate nice. all the hosts and in that but but we will be open that day for 50 people but i will probably be in vacation garb i hope that's not a i'm gonna be like in black, black tie, tie. It is. Be, is it like a james bond kind of thing yeah or? but you don't have to wear black tie i will be in black tie you will be in black you tie. can wear anything you want i'm talking like flip-flops and Hawaiian yeah shirt. i hope you do actually i hope you do that'll be great but i will be in black tie it's going to be a lot of fun we're looking forward to it um, so again, July 21st, the move in day, but we want to hold off on the party until, you know, everything's locked down and, uh, that'll be, uh, August 21st. And I, I'm so thrilled you're going to be there, Paul. That's great. Yeah. It's really weird, but it. there I am. What a coinky dink. <laughs> We're excited. Thanks, Paul Thorat. Thank you, if sir. If you want to watch this show live, you can do that Wednesday or Thursdays, rather, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv. But you don't have to watch because we make great audio and video versions available. In fact, I would recommend not doing it. <laughs> no, you'll get a much better uh, ex experience if you listen to the edited yeah, version. Yeah, we yeah, take sure. all the expletives out. Uh, that would be at twit.tv slash WW for Windows. We should apologize one more time to the people who are there. Um, In studio? I'm yeah. I Can we show her again? Uh, I feel bad. Uh, Are they gone? Does she already, is she like oh, passed out? She, I, you don't want to see. No. Uh, to Gary and Lisa Oliver, Lisa, our deepest, our deepest apologies. I'm sorry. For what you've experienced I'm today. I'm so very sorry. <laughs> and to Eric Fredericks, he's not boring anymore. He, he's, <laughs> he's a lot of fun. He's a pistol. He's quiet. He's quiet, but he's a pistol. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can catch Paul's act. At Supersite, the Win Supersite uh, at winsupersite.com. It's a great site. You can also, of course, uh, Windows IT Pro, uh, Penton Media, and don't forget his great books, Windows Secrets, Windows 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Also, oh. Windows 5 Secrets. And soon to be Windows 8 Secrets. Yes, sir. Because he's a glutton for punishment. I can't get enough. <laughs> I'll see you on uh, Google Plus. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, I'll see you next week. Thanks, Paul. Bye-bye. We've got... Uh, we have to figure out a way to uh, run this. Jason Applebaum and uh, Colin Weir. So we've got to figure out a way to run this so that we could... Because uh, I, if I turn the audio on, I, I have a few... Yeah. You see the problem. So what we have to do is I have to kind of um, have a signal that people could give us that they want to be. In. Do you want to do this, Paul, for your uh, like Q&A section? We could have people ask questions. No, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm over here with the other 750 million people in Facebook. Sorry. <laughs> Facebook? What's that? I'm Welcome. So, sorry. <laughs> so very sorry. It's my fault. I blame myself. 
Welcome to Windows. Hello. One of these eyes is not like the other. What's going on with your hair? You don't like that? You look like the elf eye today. <laughs> I took the advice of my staff. Perhaps a mistake. Really? <laughs> they said, don't comb it? Uh, no, I had <laughs> Really? I forgot to. I brushed it straight back. And uh, yeah. then we worked on some Einstein things. Mm -hmm. That didn't really work out. So they decided to go with this. It's too big, isn't it? That's oh, nice. <laughs> the problem is, you know, for years I wore these headphones that would flatten down whatever bad thing was happening. Yeah, wait. So are you not wearing headphones? No, I don't really want to hear you. Yes, I am. I'm wearing, look at these beautiful sculpted ears. I, in, in, I was in. hoping to hear I didn't have to wear them. You don't have to wear them. In fact, I will send you some sculpted ears if you want. No, no, no. I mean, can't I just use my speakers? No. No, okay. That's sack. That sucks. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> Pastor. It sucks, 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 sucks. <laughs> yeah. But I could, I could, uh, uh, once these sculpted, these aren't out yet. So no, no, I'm I don't care. This is fine. These. these are fine. These are great because they mold to your ears. You put this headband on and you press a like button stuff in my ears. and it inflates a balloon in your ear and then you have to uh, sit like this. This is what you, when you have a heart condition. A heart. That yeah, it's like angioplasty for your ear. <laughs> and then after four minutes, it hardens. You break off the headband and this Yikes. is all, and this is what remains. Oh, and it's lovely the... silicone. Comfortable Sh silicone. Shaped to your ears. Shaped to your ear. Although putting them in is a little. Yeah, I, no, 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 I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm sorry I complained. <laughs> really, really sorry. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's gotten dark in the hangout. Oh, boy. Nobody's safe. Blanket, are you there? I think there are three cameras that are black. Yeah, why is it? Why are they blacking out their camera? Because they're hiding themselves. You can mute, mute the uh, video. <clears throat> it's a cool thing to do to put your thumb over the camera lens. <laughs> Let me try. Hey, it works. <laughs> hey. <laughs> the rod's doing it.